it's a pleasure to welcome back Rowan Kalik. Rowan needs no introduction really, but he's an industry fellow at Griffith University's Asia Institute. He's an expert associate at the National Security College at ANU. Uh, he's the vice chair of the Australia Taiwan Business Council. Um, he's had a long and successful career as a journalist, and we're proud to say he's a very active and supportive fellow of the AAA. So, Rowan, thank you so much. Uh, welcome back, and the floor is yours. Thanks, sir. Thank you, and uh, lovely to see everyone on this beautiful day in Melbourne. Um, so those here in the room have, uh, uh, you could have been watching photos I've taken uh, with my phone on recent visits to Taiwan that, that have been uh, scrolling um, uh, past on the screen, uh, giving some uh, sense of Taiwan's diversity, beauty, progressive values, including strong ecological principles, and modernity. Also, if you pay close attention, it's controlled anxiety. Uh, you will have seen, as I observed for the first time on that recent trip, street signs now posted around Taipei pointing to air defense shelters. Uh, I'm going to talk this evening to everyone here and those of you joining online, Great to see you. Oh, well, I'm not seeing you, you're seeing me. Um, uh, about the Taiwan story, about the big present day focus there, the elections taking place on uh, January the 13th, about its relations with its big neighbor, the People's Republic of China, uh, and about why all this means so much, as my speech's title indicates to us in Australia. I'm going to call Taiwan a country. No other word usefully describes a place with a significant population, roughly the same as Australia's, which prints its own money, elects its own leaders, police its own, polices its own borders, and has its own military. As I wrote in the blurb for this event, Taiwan is more prosperous, more democratic, and better governed than most United Nations members. It is not a United Nations member. First, the story. It's important to get this straight from the established facts. The first clear evidence of Taiwan's indigenous inhabitants, Austronesian people from whom today's Melanesian, Micronesian and Polynesian Pacific Island peoples clearly derive dates from around 6,000 years ago. That's the first evidence. There are today about half a million indigenous Taiwanese, mostly living on their ancestral lands in the mountains. Most plain dwellers lost their land many generations ago. Portuguese sailors named the island Ilha Formosa, or Beautiful Island, in 1542. They traded but did not settle there. The first organized foreign settlers were the Dutch, who set up a base in 1623 on the Penghu Islands, then the year after on the main Taiwan island, establishing Fort Zealandia, which I recommend to everyone who's visiting as an impressive site to tour uh, in Tainan. There were a few Chinese pirate settlements on the West Coast, profiting from the fracturing of the Ming Dynasty in its dying days. Dutch traders and uh, uh, Dutch Lutheran missionaries arrived soon afterwards. The Dutch East India Company, which had established the colony from Batavia near the present Jakarta, encouraged Chinese people to come across and to farm rice. About 45 years later, the uh, most powerful pirate chief, Zhang Qinggong, turned on the Dutch and Taiwan became a pro-Ming pirate holdout against the Manchus who had invaded China. Over the next 
200 years, the Qing regime established by the Manchus started to send mandarins to make reports, but never effectively administered Taiwan. Japan incorporated the nearby Ryukyu Island chain, now named Okinawa. You can see it here. Um, in 1879 and sought to control Taiwan, where Japanese vessels had been wrecked and sailors killed by indigenous groups. It gained its chance in 1895, when in a brief war, Japan beat the Qing, who ceded Taiwan, bringing the whole island for the first time under the effective control of a single government. Some Taiwanese began to press for independence, but in 1945, the Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek took over control from Japan and put down a revolt cruelly on February 28th, 1947, killing thousands. In 1949, Chiang brought his remnant Gomindang or nationalist army across to Taiwan after losing the civil war with the Chinese Communist Party or CCP. Four harsh decades of one party martial rule followed. In time, the Gomindang or KMT abandoned their quixotic thoughts of returning to rule China. In 1996, Taiwan held its first presidential and parliamentary elections, and the government has changed peacefully three times since then. Today, the big talking point in Taiwan is the forthcoming election. On January the 13th, voters will choose a new president since the incumbent, Tsai Ing-wen, is constitutionally required to stand down after two four-year terms. They will also elect a new legislative UN, or LY, the national parliament. Last time, 75% of eligible voters cast ballots, which is high for countries with voluntary voting. The two main parties are the incumbent centre-left or Green Democratic Progressive Party and the centre-right or Blue Gomindang KMT, or Nationalist Party, a descendant of the party originally founded by Sun Yat-sen for mainland China in 1912. The DPP candidate, Lai ching -te, is a veteran politician, having trained as a doctor, then being mayor of Tainan and premier of the national government. The KMT candidate is Ho Yo Yi, a former policeman, the mayor of New Taipei City. Mayors and local governments generally are also elected in Taiwan. The third candidate is Ke Wenzhe, mayor of New Taipei City today, a former medical doctor and leader of the uh, uh, kind of centrist Taiwan People's Party, which he founded and whose main aim in contending may well be to provide impetus for more seats in the LY, building on their present five seats. The fourth and final candidate is Terry Go, the billionaire founder of Honhai Precision, or Foxconn, the world's largest electronics contract manufacturer, maker, for example, of most of the world's iPhones. His running mate is especially interesting, Tammy Lai, a, a famous actress who played a Tsai Ing-wen style role in the smash hit Netflix series, Wave Makers. I thoroughly recommend everyone interested in democratic politics in general to watch this show if you've got access to Netflix. Um, it's about a young team running a presidential election campaign with a strong social media focus and with a powerful Me Too subplot. Taiwan elections are first past the post, so can be tough to call. 
In 2000, the DPP's Chen Shui-bian won with just 39% of the vote, with the um, KMT's Lian Zhan and James Sung, founder of the People First Party, splitting the conservative vote between them. Control of the LY is also up for grabs. The DPP holds at present 64 of the 113 seats, but it's feasible that even if Lai wins the presidency for the DPP and he's leading all polls right now, he might need to negotiate with a hostile parliament to get legislation passed, as happens with our own Senate. And winning a third term is tough for any party in any country. In recent polling, the top issue concerning voters was the tech-led economy with export demand from China, which, reminds, which remains Taiwan's largest market, the Euro US and Europe fading this year. Though the Bank of Taiwan chairman told me that elections help, generally help fire up Taiwan's economy with big bucks always spent by candidates and parties. In general, the DPP is working for greater economic diversity, including through its new southbound policy into Southeast Asia and India, while the other candidates' main economic thrust looks to greater benefits from business with China. Taiwan's investments in China were five years ago double those in ASEAN, and now they're about equal. The next biggest issue is the cross-strait situation, with all four presidential candid candidates favoring the status quo. Other issues from those deemed most important down are cost of housing, welfare, jobs, healthcare, infrastructure, air pollution, and cultural concerns. At the municipal elections round on November 26th, Last year, the DPP only won five of 22 city and county mayor positions, the KMT winning 13. This despite widespread perceptions that the national government had managed the COVID pandemic comparatively well. But turnout was just 60%, and many younger voters who usually back the DPP will turn out in January. The DPP initiated a referendum to reduce the voting age from 20, as it is now, to 18, but failed last November to win a sufficient majority. And hundreds of thousands of immigrants, principally from Southeast Asia, also now from Hong Kong, are now able to vote in Taiwan elections. And now the China issue. I'm sorry, but this tale has many twists, so I trust you'll stay with me. The 1928 National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, classified Taiwanese people as a separate ethnicity from ethnic Chinese. In party documents in the 1930s, Taiwanese were characterized in a similar way to Koreans or Vietnamese. In 1936, Mao Zedong told the American journalist Edgar Snow about Taiwanese pushing against their Japanese rulers that the party could, quotes, extend our enthusiastic help in their struggle for independence, close quotes. But the 1943 Cairo Declaration by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek required that Taiwan will go to the Republic of China if and when Japan was defeated. So it did and remains, still named the ROC, after Chiang fled there in 1949 after civil war defeat. During the PRC's great proletarian cultural revolution from 1966 to 1976, Beijing's anxiety about Soviet intentions drove detente with Washington. 
which in response switched to recognizing the PRC as China rather than the ROC on Taiwan, which had been strategically important for the US during the Korean and Vietnamese wars. Beijing in turn sought with greater intensity what it calls reunification with Taiwan, adopting the same one country, two systems formula it agreed for Hong Kong. Although the subjugation of Hong Kong since the national security law was introduced there two years ago, is it three, two, two, two years ago, um, <clears throat> means that no serious figure in Taiwan even mentions one country, two systems anymore. <clears throat> Yet today's PRC population has been brought up to believe unswervingly, as the Chinese ambassador to Australia stated recently, <clears throat> that Taiwan, which is 160 kilometers off the Fujian coast, has been China's since ancient times and must return. The problem is that few people in Taiwan view themselves as Chinese or evince any interest in becoming part of the PRC, whose authoritarian politics, increase, increasingly repressed culture, and now lackluster economy seem comparatively distant and unattractive. In recent polling, just 4% of the population in Taiwan said they call themselves exclusively Chinese. Most simply call themselves Taiwanese, with China not a place of a special connection or resonance beyond the substantial business connections. In 1949, the average incomes of people in China and Taiwan were similar. Today, the Taiwanese earn on average five times more, and their median wealth is four times more. While about a million Taiwanese went to work in China during the reform and opening period there, this is the old era, the Deng Xiaoping era, and Taiwanese firms invested an estimated 100 billion US dollars in factories there, playing a crucial role alongside Hong Kongers in driving China to become the world's factory. The trend is now in reverse with Taiwan government incentives playing their part in reshoring Taiwanese investments from China. Taiwan's production of about half all semiconductors made worldwide, including 90% of the most advanced chips, adds a layer of complexity to this drama. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, is dominant, especially in terms of innovation in production, and says it invests sufficiently in research to stay two generations ahead of PRC rivals. Meanwhile, the CCP General Secretary, Xi Jinping, has elevated Taiwan to a core issue for the party. The great missing jigsaw piece in national rejuvenation he said at last year's party congress, resolving the Taiwan issue is the Chinese people's own business and is up to the Chinese people to decide, he said. We insist on striving for the prospect of peaceful reunification, but we will never promise to give up the use of force and reserve the option to take all necessary measures, close quotes. He said earlier that this historic mission cannot be passed down from generation to generation. She, the great champion of Han ethnocentrism, loves to use the metaphor of blood. He has said of the Taiwanese, we are a family whose blood is thicker than water, brothers and sisters of the same blood. The indigenous population, of course, is not within that family. 
One of the many bizarre elements in this tense situation is that Taiwan's constitution, albeit amended slightly from time to time, essentially still comprises that of the Republic of China drawn up in 1947. Taiwan uses as its flag that of the ROC, incorporating the emblem of Sun Yat-sen's Gomindang. These signs of statehood continue to link Taiwan with mainland China, and Taiwan fears that if they are abandoned, Be Beijing might claim this as tant tantamount to seeking full independence. The PRC has also developed a catechism around its One China principle, which it wants foreign states to follow, incorporating the idea that democratic Taiwan is now inexorably part of that One China, even though it appears by most measures not to be. I should add that the CCP tends to take the position that all people of Chinese ethnicities should concede ultimate loyalty to Beijing as sons and daughters of the Yellow Emperor, even though they may be nationals of other countries, in a way that all people of, say, Anglo ethnicities do not tend to automatically accept the leadership of the British monarch. Sharing a language and even elements of a culture does not usually require that to happen within a single nation. Australia's Defence Strategic Review, delivered in April, said that China's military build-up is now the largest and most ambitious of any country since the end of the Second World War, close quotes. The seizure of Taiwan is its only clear purpose. The People's Liberation Army has become in recent times also a blue water navy with greatly enhanced capability to project force convincingly across the Taiwan Strait. In recent times, Chinese ships and jet fighters have constantly entered Taiwan's economic zone, including in combat formations, and it has positioned hundreds of missiles ready to attack the island. As for Australia, we have a natural connection with a country in our region that is a lively democracy, that respects the rule of law, that has an indigenous population facing many similar issues to our own indigenous people, whose economy is very complementary. As you've already heard from Alistair, it's Australia's fourth biggest export market. It's placed about 65 billion Aussie dollars in the Australian financial system with nine banks operating here. And more young Taiwanese come here through the working holiday scheme than come from any other country. But the relationship remains mostly undeveloped, chiefly due to the political constraints demanded and achieved by Beijing. The top key performance indicator for Chinese diplomats is mostly to close down Taiwan's international space. In switching diplomatic loyalty to the PRC, in December 1972, our own government stated that Australia, quotes, recognizes the government of the PRC as the sole legal government of China, close quotes, something everyone in Taiwan has now done also for decades. And I'm continuing that sentence, quoting again, and Australia acknowledges the position of the Chinese government that Taiwan is a province of the PRC, close quotes. So we acknowledge that that's the position of the Chinese government, but we do not uh, accept that as our own position. That formula provides for a cornucopia of connections short of diplomatic recognition, while saying nothing about what Canberra believes Taiwan now to be. Thus, it seems odd that while Australia has 59 sister city or state relations with the PRC, it has just six with Taiwan. 
and none in Victoria. Australia has sent no federal minister to Taiwan since Craig Emerson 12 years ago, yet many other countries, including Britain, have recently sent their trade ministers there. Australia's states and cities could readily relate to Taiwan, but with the exception of Queensland, whose treasurer Cameron Dick recently flew to Taipei to make a, a major speech at a business conference I was at, they don't because they're warned against doing so by the PRC. Eight Australian bipartisan federal MPs visited Taiwan a couple of weeks ago as part of a regular program. The Chinese ambassador here in Canberra swiftly lambasted them in a speech in Sydney at an event celebrating the PRC's National Day, claiming that our MPs, quotes, might be easily utilized by the political forces in Taiwan for their secession movement. And I don't want to see that happen, close quotes. He hoped Australian politicians would, quotes, refrain from engaging with Taiwan in whichever form or capacity. Their words, their actions on Taiwan will absolutely bring about a negative effect on the ongoing improvement of our relationship between China and Australia, close quotes. Global Times quoted a Shanghai academic as warning our prime minister that if he, quotes, truly wants to mend ties with China, he should oppose, condemn, and then rein in the rogue behavior of our own MPs. Tomorrow, I should add, Taiwan's representatives here in Victoria, and I'm delighted to say there's one here this evening, are hosting an event to celebrate their national day. We've heard, scarcely heard any complaint from that quarter, despite our governments largely leaving them out in the cold. So why then does all this matter so much to us? Because Taiwan provides an important model for our kind of values in our region, it matters for its own sake, therefore. But if we, the Indo-Pacific democracies, fail to deter the CCP from taking military action to incorporate Taiwan, then war will follow. This will, of course, be terrible for all. If Beijing were to win, so very much the worse for all. Australia has come to believe that its sovereignty comes cost-free to us. That is changing. Xi's front foot challenge to Taiwan, among other big issues, is requiring us to consider the costs we may need to bear to maintain our culture and our prosperity. First, if there's a war. One of the variables increasingly preoccupying military minds is when does a cyber attack or an air blockade, drills that increase, drills, close quotes, that increasingly take on the profile of genuine incursions, fishing fleets that sail close and, and supported by armed militia vessels, or the cutting of underseas communication cables, or gray zone pressure applied to shipping all around the island, or low-intensity military forays, uh, say, close to smaller Taiwanese islands, when do they become classified as an act of war? Beijing would like, likely keep turning up the heat on Taiwan through such diverse strategies, seeking a surrender before undertaking the massively risky first major amphibious assault anywhere in the world since Incheon in Korea 73 years ago. The PLA is untested in combat conditions. Its last large-scale action comprising its failed attack on Vietnam in 1979. Taiwan is doing its best to learn resilience lessons from Ukraine. It has upped its defense budget by 8% recently, has extended its Compulsory military service from four to 12 months is stockpiling musician, mu munitions, not musicians, but maybe that also is stockpiling munitions, energy, water and food, 
is building other asymmetric capabilities, including urban fighting, building its reservist skills and its civil defense for the broader population. It wants to become a porcupine, hard to handle. It's greatly increased the numbers of sea mines and attack and surveillance drones. The mountainous island is presumed riddled with tunnel systems. President Tsai last week launched the first of a new class of Taiwan-built submarines. Hard for us in Australia to imagine just how far in the distance we will be uh, enjoying that. One lesson of the Ukraine war is that deterrence was inadequate. Another is that tough economic sanctions will follow a clear act of aggression. Unlike Russia, the PRC's economy is intensely globally engaged and it's already sliding, not rising. What will happen if it's largely shut out from North America, Europe, Japan, and South Korea, and many other countries too? Even in scenarios short of full-scale war, Australia looms large in the economic sites of all sides, since its iron ore provides China with about half the ore it needs to make steel including the vast quantities needed for its immense naval buildup. Our ore sales to China comprise about 20% of our total worldwide goods and services income. And Western Australia's government with 25% of its revenues. Lithium has become recently Australia's second biggest export to China, vital for batteries and for lightweight alloys, and with considerable strategic applications. Australia was last year responsible for 53% of global lithium production, but 96% was exported to China. Such sales would cease once Washington declares that Beijing has committed an act of war. For those continuing to sell strategic resources to China will be locked out of the dollar system, which is of course the global reserve currency. The Australian dollar would slump, pushing up substantially the price of imports and forcing cuts in government services, and we would search for new sources for many products now made in China. Economic analysis, analyst David Duren has written that the global impact of the loss of trade through the Taiwan Strait will be incomparably greater than that flowing from the Ukraine war. Ben Herskovich of the ANU says, this is a conversation Australia should be having now. The especially ticklish issue for the Albanese government is that for the prospect of such economic punishments to have a real deterrent effect on China, they'll need to be signaled in advance, close quotes. Frustratingly for Australian governments, for mining companies, for millions of shareholders, including via everyone's super schemes, the brittle nature of East Asian security in the new era of Xi Jinping requires the unthinkable to be thought through, deterred if possible, and guarded against if not. China fighting Taiwan would engage our number one export market with number four and immediately drag numbers two and three, Japan and Korea, into the resulting imbroglio. Almost half the world's 5,400 container ships sail regularly through the Taiwan Strait. What are the odds of conflict? I place them at a guess at around 40% within the next decade. Who would win? That depends to a degree on the willingness of the US to deploy its full might to defend or to retake maybe Taiwan. If the US steps away from its support for Taiwan, including rhetorically, if Beijing is confident in the PLA's strength, if Taiwan's own forces seem weak, China will invade. One would still have to bet on US success if, China, if Washington were to engage fully. It would also depend on other regional powers. Japan is arming rapidly and has recently built a major base at Ishigaki on an island less than 300 kilometers from Taiwan down there. South Korea has buried the hatchet with Japan and a trilateral strategic relationship has recently been in inaugurated with the US. 
The Philippines is rapidly building its own military ties with the US and others, with Albanese signing an agreement there last month. The roles of AUKUS, the Quad, and other minilaterals will be important. So the US has, with its partners, undergone a radical forces posture shift in the region, which kind of democratizes the task. The old narrative of the US alone holding or even seeking regional hegemony has been surpassed and quietly replaced. Whether China can win depends to agree on Beijing's ultimate aim. If it, it might be to win the Taiwanese over by argument, which would take patience and time. It could follow the successful Hong Kong playbook, introduce draconian legislation uh, to encourage potential troublemakers to flee overseas, jail those who stay, anoint trusted and loyal new leaders, replace the Taiwan culture and language with the PRCs, and re-educate young Taiwanese. The KMC, KMT itself did something similar in 1945 and again in 1949. Worse but unlikely would be pursuing a form of vacant possession, focusing on gaining defendable possession of the island. A failure to take Taiwan or prolonged and painful meter by meter battle for full control with one of the world's most wired and cosmopolitan populations filling mainstream and social media worldwide with their accounts could provide an existential challenge for the party. It would certainly be its most difficult hour since 1949. What would a clear Chinese victory look like? And this is my final point. Its recent and rapid militarization of the South China Sea provides one indication, with rival claimants relentlessly pushed out of their fishing and mining zones. Surely the East China Sea and other strategic zones would be similarly incorporated. So this is the South China Sea, that's the East China Sea. Um, seizure of Taiwan and American withdrawal would see all of East and Southeast Asia become a Chinese sphere of influence. US forces would depart Japan, Korea, and Australia. America would have to de decide how and how heavily to defend Guam, which is just over there, just to the east of our map, and even Hawaii. Beijing would press outwards, operationalizing options it already holds for advanced bases in places such as Solomon Islands, just to the uh, east of New Guinea there, um, Cambodia, and elsewhere, including now, where is it, uh, Timor, new, a new arrangement there. Um, <clears throat> Japan and Korea might well choose to arm themselves instead with nuclear weapons. Democratic governments, governance would be destabilized in Southeast Asia, where the PRC's influence has already helped to erode it. At home, she has recently elevated common security alongside common prosperity as core goals. He wants to rebuild the economy so it's self-sufficient and more responsive, especially in technology, while still dominating global manufacturing. Internationally, he wants a new order centered around China with his global security initiative, global development initiative, global civilization initiative, now being promoted together with the Belt and Road Initiative, which continues to weaponize China's economic heft, albeit that's now declining. Xi's key thought on socialism with Chinese characteristic for a new era will provide the template for the entire region if the Americans can be ejected via an epochal battle for Taiwan. This new global order would also permit China to determine the key terms of its engagement with Australia, albeit it might wish to appear generous in the way it's already being thanked by Australians right now for drip by drip restoring some of the trade arrangements it previously chose to withdraw for its own political reasons. As Stanford academic Christopher Ford says, in such a future world, all countries will be expected to defer to the CCP's preferences on matters of significance. Indeed, the core present aim of the party is to make the world safe for itself now and for future generations. The Chinese characteristics of this new global order 
include a return to ancient conceptions of imperial tributary deference, including discourse power, which states like Australia on the outer reaches may voluntarily concede. She's already traveling less and less and expecting international leaders to come more routinely to meet him in the great hall of the people. The open rules-based international order that enables countries to interact on an equal footing despite natural differentials, which is at the heart of the Westphalian uh, concept for modern states, will be amended crucially by a PRC seizure of Taiwan with its insistence on challenging other countries' sovereignty in order to shape their own discourse about China, while any attempt by others to enter into discourse within China will be branded as intolerable interference. We would play by Beijing rules. So yes, Taiwan is an island about half the size of Tasmania, whose fate either way in the event of conflict or via the status quo, if blessedly not, will help determine that of Australia. Thank you for your patience. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll take questions in the room. Um, I've got a roving mic coming round. If you could just state your name and keep it to a brief question, please, and I'll get to as many as we can. Superb, Rowan. Thanks very much. Um, in 2016, I did a project in Manila. I was renting a place walking distance from the, um, Andrew Phelan's my name, uh, from the US war cemetery at Bonifacio Global City. There's 5,000 or so crucifixes there and frescoes from the Pacific War in the middle of it. And after that, I went to Palau and you could see some of those war cannons. My point is you can kind of hear the echoes of the Pacific War and you can see how you know, the vultures are sort of circling in this circumstance at the moment. Obviously, the gravity of the situation is, you know, incredibly serious. My question to you is, other than a handful of people perhaps that are following this closely and get it, the Australian public seems to be relatively unaware of the situation through mainstream media. What are your thoughts on that and how that might change? Okay, it's changing... It's, it's changing step by step at the moment uh, by a kind of um, own goal, to use a, a soccer term. You can hear I'm English, so I understand soccer. And uh, that's because they uh, effectively evicted um, almost all foreign journalists from Beijing. So we have, for example, uh, um, probably the the most uh, impressive writer for The Economist. We've got the uh, a really uh, one or two terrific writers for The Guardian. We've got The Australians, uh, Will Glasgow. We've got a new ABC reporter there, um, all covering um, uh, uh, China and the region, North Asia from Taiwan. So I think we're going to see, and uh, Chris Buckley, the doyen of Australian journalists covering China, who's the, of course, New York Times chief uh, China correspondent. So, uh, so who, Chris is an Australian, of course. So uh, it's uh, very, uh, it's the mainstream media is now seeing things more from that, from that, perspective. When you look at the polling in the Lowy Institute, you see that uh, uh, Australians um, kind of from information, kind of from instinct, uh, are supportive of Taiwan. And I think it's part of a pattern that you see is elites are uh, to an extent suborned and uh, the basic Australian population has good instincts, I think, <laughs> on these things about what counts, the values that count, and so on. So I'm I'm not unhappy uh, about that, but I th I think people should and could learn more. The best way is people to fly to Taiwan. You can go there direct from uh, the major Australian cities. By major, I mean Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane, and you can fly there direct, and you don't need a visa. So if anyone wants to fly there tomorrow, book a flight, and you just turn up, 
and you can be there for three months. And that's the best way of enjoying yourself in this wonderful place and uh, also learning a bit more. I think more people going would be great. Thanks. Uh, Zara Kimpton, National Vice President. Um, I, you know, China sees Taiwan as a territorial cha challenge. Um, that's the, the physical Taiwan, the people of Taiwan. They don't want China from, to, be, be, to be governed by China, as you just told us. What will happen if, if it does happen, does, if the Chinese do take over? Uh, we're seeing in Hong Kong, the people are having to accept it. Do you think there will be a mass exodus of people from Taiwan? If so, where would they go? Would there be a, a, a refugee crisis or would countries um, in the Western world be prepared to accept a lot of highly educated people? Um, or is there somewhere where they could all go and find a new home? I think that's a good question. I, people... Um... Hong Kong is a uh, is a, a different situation because uh, Hong Kong people uh, have went from uh, British colonial situation straight to a kind of Chinese colonial situation. Of course, many people that live in Hong Kong are people who sought to escape from communism and came to Hong Kong, and now they find it's really caught up with them big time. Um, so, uh, and members of the Hong Kong of Hong Kong's, let's say, intellectual elite, many have left. In Taiwan's case, it's a bit different in that that's their, for many people, it's their ancestral home. Um, and they don't have entitlement to live somewhere else, which uh, the, uh, the British provided quite a lot of people in Hong Kong. So it's going to be uh, tough if they want to leave, if they want to stay on and uh, challenge uh uh, the, the uh, CCP, the party is a very determined organisation and it's quite capable of, over time, uh, supplanting the population. Uh, it will bring people there. It will build, it's uh, already we've been hearing about a bridge being built from Fujian and uh, it will bring people there. And uh, so there will be... Um, no shortage, in my view, of people coming there. We've seen that in Tibet. We've seen that in Xinjiang. So what we've seen is the hand-centric uh, CCP dominating, um, moving outwards and dominating, filling the borderlands uh, by sending people out there. So t Tibet, Xinjiang are both in this kind of situation. I think that kind of solution would probably work quite quite well for uh, the for the party thanks Ron Andy Lloyd's my name um, and thank you for a very well researched and logical presentation uh, I must declare I'm a director of a small bauxite producer in Queensland that sells all its product to the mainland China uh, my question is about your comments on the economic uh, embargoes that are potentially arise in the event of, a, of an invasion. Um, how important is this signalling early and how might it be uh, reinforced, I suppose? And do you see the AUKUS Alliance as being a potential body that might make a difference here and in particular potentially with Japan joining the AUKUS Alliance? Oh yes, thank you. Good question. Oh, I kind of all of the uh, all of the above. I think signalling early is very important. I think uh, deterrence is the most important thing. The big lesson that well, we should have learned from uh, what happened in Ukraine. Um, and I, I think uh, uh, Xi Jinping is a very different person from uh, Vladimir Putin, and. Uh, uh, He's a person of his party. He's not uh, a solo dictator like uh, Putin. So we, it's, a, it's a different situation and uh, a situation in which um, uh, rational judgments will play, their, will play their role. And I think in this case, um, uh, it's important to um, explain what the implications are. I believe that the Americans have... Are already 
doing this in a quite sensible manner. At the moment, to an extent, increasingly, um, as she has, uh, she's uh, control of the party has become um, more and more uh, full. Uh, the pattern of decision making has become more difficult to track. Who is who? What is the debate at the, in top levels? There's a kind of black box in China. So the U.S. has um, has started to send more and more senior uh, administrators from the system to Beijing, and they've been talking about <laughs> climate change and the economy and other things. That's their responsibility. I believe they've also been sent to send messages, knowing that people have that elevation will send message to a sufficiently elevated counterpart in China that it would reach Xi Jinping, or they can maybe speak to him directly. So that uh, the message is, um, so that there's not a misunderstanding. And uh, very important that we don't have misunderstandings here. And, and people have talked about uh, um, uh, military to military discussions in which um uh misunderstandings there are um avoided guardrails is the term used china's not too keen on that because they think actually that means we concede some ground to the americans so let's leave that to one side but Im important those big messages get on and that for example your company um uh you would uh, being on the board, you would have to face a, a very tough question if uh, if there was a war, uh, and I believe that uh, there would be um, a, quite immediately, both among your staff, customers, shareholders, a sense we're not going to continue to supply a country deemed as uh, hostile. We saw in World War One. this happened actually in Australia. Broken Hill was selling pretty well all everything to Germany. And uh, uh, the British moved in and said, we will buy the uh, output instead. And so obviously that was very difficult, uh, again, because uh, these are base metals uh, being used uh, for armaments to kill Australians who volunteered to to fight in that combat. So I think very important. What was your other point? I think that's AUKUS. Yeah, I think AUKUS is a very valuable thing. Let's leave this uh, nuclear submarines to one side, which is kind of uh, very much in the future. Pillar two, which involves uh, modern technologies, um, quantum, cyber, and so on. This is, uh, this is an area of great activity between uh, the three countries involved and uh, building, for example, a lot of discussion about building um, uh, a sustainable critical minerals um, supply chain that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't rely on sending everything to China and then back and uh, so on. So it is co concentrating minds and uh, bringing capabilities to bear. I think it's, uh, it's proving a very uh, important step. We're just, we're to, so we're just going to have to move on to the next one. We're running a bit short of time. Right, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the lessons being learned uh, from uh, the Ukraine war. Um, and you also mentioned the, the tech-savvy uh, uh, aspect of the uh, Taiwanese population. Uh, one of the things that surprised most people, including myself, uh, about the Ukraine war is the extent to which for at least the first six to nine months, Ukraine essentially won the information war, and which was critical for bringing the West onto its side and unifying the West, uh, and the promotion of Zelensky as the figure which everybody uh, could feel uh, uh, was leading the, the, this battle. Um, looking at uh, Taiwan's future leadership, do you see a similar sort of uh, person with a global outlook that could win the West over to his side? I, that's a great question, Richard. I, 
I can't say that I do. I, but people wouldn't have expected Zelensky to emerge either. Uh, and But uh, Taiwan is the sort of place capable of producing that sort of a person. Uh, and that's all I, all I can say. And because it, uh, it's such a tech-savvy place, we will not be lacking information and powerful visuals from the first minute that any conflict happens, which will put huge pressure to bear on our own government to uh, do the utmost, in my view, uh, uh, by comparison with the U the connections between Australia and Ukraine, yes, connection between Australia and Taiwan, although not nearly as strong as I said they should be, are quite substantial. We try and get a couple more done. Come with David, and then gentleman here, and Paul. There, we might run out of time. David Livingston, thank you so much, Rowan, for a deeply thought out presentation. Um, you have a scholarly knowledge of the CCP, including your book, Party Time. Thank you. Um, how important would you say the leadership of Xi is to the current tensions? And if it is important, could the tensions change uh, if Xi weren't there? Yeah, I think, great question. I, I think it could change. Uh, so even though the, the, the party is organised, it's been in power for uh, 74 years there, and it's over a century old. Um, uh, it does depend on on uh, leadership, and she has personalised and centralised power in a manner that hasn't happened since uh, uh, really since Mao. And uh, so his finger on everything is there. He wants to see everyone. He's removed the government from loads of roles and brought in the party to to run directly. Uh, all sorts of areas, science, tech, finance, and so on. So, yes, uh, uh, she not being there would change things immensely. Of course, it depends who, who replaces him. It would be a man, I think it's safe to say. Almost no women in any senior position in China. Uh, very strangely, since Mao said they help women hold up half the sky. But um, I think she that would that could change things quite a lot. Um, he's a very unusual person. He's got a kind of theocratic uh, disposition and uh, his psychological drivers are, I won't go on, I don't have time to now, but I think that changing the leader would change a lot. We'll just try to get two, two last quick ones in and then we can have a chat after it's around in the room. Okay, thank you. Um, Charles Richardson, um, it seems to me there's, there's both in Australia and the US, there's two different debates going on here at, at sort of at cross purposes. There's an argument about is an invasion of Taiwan a serious possibility? You know, is this something that needs to be on the radar? And there's a debate about, well, if it does happen, is this a, is this something we should be concerned about? Is defence of Taiwan a core interest or not? Now, obviously, the second question has radically different policy implications, depending on what your view is. My question is, what about differences in the first? If If you think this is really just a remote possibility, even if you concede it would be a dreadful thing if it did happen, how much should that change what we do? Uh, right. I, I, um, deterrence is perhaps the answer that uh, we need to take it seriously in order to deter that, even though, as I said, it's a minority, in my view, a minority likelihood that it's going to happen. But I've elevated my own... Uh, view from you know, uh, scarcely likely to 40% because of reading uh, the constant amount of uh, focus on this in central party documents and so on. So I think it's a very important issue for, for the CCP and uh, 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 the best way of tackling it from outside and from time if you're inside to an extent, Taiwan, is to take it seriously and seek to deter it. We'll just grab one more. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Alistair. Um, Paul Monk, um, Rowan, uh, I was very struck when you said that uh, Taiwan is seeking to adopt what you call a porcupine strategy, and you're probably aware, but I'm not sure how many other people in the room are, that Sam Rogovin at Lowy Institute has just had published a book called The Echidna Strategy, 
in which he, he argues... Well, uh, 18th of October. Yes, and, and, and he argues that Australia should itself withdraw from the US alliance, do everything it can to appease China, but have a, a robust denial strategy to defend itself in case China should happen to seek to invade the Australian continent. Um, I've written a systematic critique of the book, and I've known Sam for a long time. I like him as a person. I think he's, he's seriously wrong about this. But but this is part of the public debate. And so my, my question is, uh, and given that he's coming here, I encourage people to come along. Sam's a very pleasant person. But I, I've argued we do need to engage with his argument, but we need to persuade uh, those who are uncertain about this that he's in error uh, about Australia adopting that strategy. Um, and uh, Yeah, Taiwan matters in, immensely. And those people are uh, completely wrong-headed. If, if China... Um, uh, pursues full-scale conflict of Taiwan, no way could any Australian government survive a day or two without responding in a very substantial way. There's the, the Prime Minister who would say, while well, all of us in this room, uh, all social media, every TV channel, everything we look is full of uh, articulate uh, Taiwanese people talking about what's happening, showing you the vision of people being killed, babies being killed, whatever. Uh, and here's our prime minister in Canberra being stopped outside the parliament and being asked about Taiwan. He said, no, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm talking about our new agricultural policy. Uh, it, it will be the end for that person. And so those people who take this view have have no sense of uh, understanding of uh, how politics works and how uh, those things work. They're wrong, yeah. clearly. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. It, unsurprisingly, we've run out of time. It's <laughs> it's such a huge topic, Rowan. It's been an absolute tour de force. Again, thank you. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to the, all the questions in the room. Sorry on Zoom we couldn't get to them. We will send the recording. But, uh, Ron, thanks again for making the time coming talking to us. Please join me in giving a good round of applause.